I'm Russ Miller of Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. I want to start out by reading from Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created during his six-day creation with the seventh day of Sabbath rest. In fact, Jesus Christ says man was made since the beginning in both Mark and in Matthew. So on the sixth day of the creation week, God made Adam and Eve. Did you know that you're made up of an estimated 80 trillion cells? Well, let's talk about comprehending humongous numbers for a moment. Let's use seconds as something we can discuss and comprehend. A million seconds ago was about 11 and a half days ago. What's the difference between a million and a billion? If a million seconds ago was 11 and a half days ago, a billion seconds ago was 32 years ago. And what's the difference between a billion and a trillion? Well, if a billion seconds ago was 32 years ago, a trillion seconds ago would have been 32,000 years of time if that much time had existed. So if each of your cells were represented by a second, that would cover 2,560,000 years of time. You are very complex. God made you that way in his own image. Now, each of your cell's DNA contain three billion base pairs of genetic information per cell. You are very complex. Let's look at some of the fingerprints of God upon his creation. I want to look at a short section of a video that covers the information processing system found inside of a cell which screams intelligent biblical designer. This comes from Illustria Media Unlocking the Mystery of Life. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function.
after the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. As we're told in scripture, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to talk today about astronomical God in the highest. I want to show you that the universe declares the glory of our biblical creator. That God's fingerprints are seen throughout his creation. From inside of a cell to the deepest parts of outer space. And I want to discuss some of the celestial bodies made on day four. And I also want you to talk about the star of Bethlehem, the Christmas star. The Bible tells us God formed the earth to be inhabited. Earth was the first celestial body made. Earth's gravity, for instance, is perfect for allowing life to exist on our planet. Did you know that the earth is spinning at about a thousand miles per hour at the equator? Well, what keeps us on the earth? What keeps us from being thrown into outer space? Well, the gravity that God put here to govern the Earth's creation. Now, did you know that the Earth is, as we speak, hurtling through space at over 66,000 miles per hour? That's 30 times faster than a speeding bullet. But the gravity allows us to live our lives here on this planet. We're also told that on the fourth day of creation, God made the two greater lights one to rule the day and one to rule the night, the sun and the moon made on day four of the creation week. Well, God put the earth a perfect distance from a perfect star to allow life to exist on our planet. Most stars pulsate. That's the reason they look as though they twinkle. They pulsate giving off huge amounts of cosmic radiation and cosmic rays. Well, if our sun did that, it would wipe out life on earth in a matter of minutes. Our sun, however, is a very evenly burning star that doesn't greatly pulsate and destroy life. God put us the perfect distance from a perfect star to allow life to exist. For instance, water is only liquid in a 180 degree range. Well, the temperatures in the universe go from tens of millions of degrees inside of stars to minus hundreds of degrees that we know of in outer space. So there are tens of millions of degrees in range of temperatures, and yet water is only liquid in a tiny little percentage, a very small range of about 180 degrees. Now, if we were about 2% closer to the sun, all the water would evaporate and there'd be no life on earth today. If we were 2% further from the sun, all the water would freeze and there'd be no life on earth today. God put the planet earth, which he made for us to inhabit, a perfect distance from the perfect star to allow life to exist. God put the sun about 93 million miles away from our planet and it takes sunlight eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. How big is the sun? Well, almost one million earths would fit inside of the sun. Our sun is immense and its energy output enormous. The core of the sun is a scorching 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Though the sun is 93 million miles from Earth, sunlight is our main source of energy. Energy leaves the sun at the ferocious rate of 5 million tons of matter per second. This goes on day and night, year after year. A year is defined by one revolution of the Earth around the sun. 
A month is loosely defined by one revolution of the moon around the Earth. And a day comes from one spin of the Earth upon its axis. So where does a week come from? It comes from the biblical creation. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth the seas and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. We're told on the fourth day that God made the stars also. Now a star could actually refer to any celestial orb from what we call stars today to nebulas to comets, etc. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. In fact, it is 1,000 times the size of the Earth. This is a depiction of some of the larger planets in our solar system compared to the Sun. The Earth is that little blue dot right here. And the Earth isn't quite that big, but that's the smallest dot I could get to show up on the screen. So on day four, God made the Sun and the Moon, and then it's almost like an afterthought. Well, I'll make the stars also. Let me show you what your biblical God, your biblical creator does in his spare time. In his spare time, God made the stars also. And I want to show you some of his fingerprints found throughout his universe, which he made the heavens and the celestial orbs on the fourth day. From 1 Corinthians, we're told that one star differs from another star in its glory. The Bible says that all stars are different. And what we know today is much like fingerprints and like snowflakes tend to differ. Stars also differ by size, by the amount of energy they put out, by the color of their light. Stars differ from one another. They all exhibit the glory of God. This is called cosmic pearls. We gave it that name for an obvious reason. It looks like a string of pearls. I like to tell folks that cosmic pearls come from cosmic oysters. <laughs> My wife tells me not to go there. We're told in Isaiah that God stretched forth the heavens. Our present measuring device for the God's universe is a light year. Well, the present speed of light through our solar system is 186,282 miles per second. So a light year covers 6 trillion miles. So first of all, recognize that a light year is actually a measurement of distance, not of time. Let's get back to comprehending huge numbers. A million seconds ago was about 11 and a half days ago. A billion seconds ago would have been about 1982. And a trillion seconds ago would have been 30,000 BC if such a date had existed. There's a big, big difference in these numbers. Now, this is a depiction of our sun compared to Pollux. Pollux is one of the closest stars to our planet. God put Pollux about 34 light years away from the Earth. It is so big, it is nine times the diameter of our sun in which almost a million Earths would fit. The Bible talks about God making Arcturus. Now, and this is again our depiction of the sun next to Pollux. And here is Pollux compared to Arcturus. Arcturus is a really big star. It's a runaway star that's hurtling at over 400,000 miles per hour through the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 37 light years away from our planet. Betelgeuse is a really big star that's 427 light years away from planet Earth. It is so big, it is twice the diameter of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now that's a big star. That's a really big star. It's estimated that 262 trillion Earths would fit into Betelgeuse. This is on Teres. It's 600 light years away from our planet. Now in our last depiction, this was the sun compared to Arcturus. Now in the new depiction, here is Arcturus compared to Betelgeuse. And here's Betelgeuse compared to Antares. Those are some big stars. It's estimated that the diameter of Antares is 700 times the diameter of our sun, in which almost a million Earths would fit. 
In the book of Amos, we're told to seek him that makes the seven stars. The Lord is his name. This is referring to a group of seven runaway stars hurtling at about 90,000 miles an hour through the Milky Way galaxy. They're also called the Seven Sisters. Here is Musephi. It's estimated that 1.2 billion suns would fit into this giant star. Now, wait a minute. I didn't say 1.2 billion Earths. 1.2 billion suns would fit into Musephi with almost a million Earths in each one of those suns. Mind-boggling what God has done on his fourth day of creation. Musephi's diameter is equal to Jupiter's orbit around the sun. That's a big star. Now, in our last depiction of stars, Antares was the big star. Now, here's Antares compared to Musephi. It's estimated 2.7 quadrillion Earths would fit into Musephi. 2.7 quadrillion, but hey, wait a minute. We haven't discussed quadrillion. Let's get back to comprehending big numbers. Using uh, seconds again as our example, a billion seconds ago would be about 32 years ago. A trillion seconds would be 32,000 years of time. Well, what's the difference between a trillion and a quadrillion? Well, a quadrillion seconds ago would be 32 million years of time. One quadrillion seconds. These numbers are huge mongous in nature. <laughs> Let's skip ahead to the largest star known to mankind. That would be Canis Majoris, which is 5,000 light years away from our planet. Now, in our last depiction of stars, this was Antares compared to Musephi. And here is Musephi compared to Canis Majoris. That is a really big star. It is estimated that seven quadrillion Earths would fit into this humongous star. In fact, it is so big, it would take light eight hours to circle that planet, traveling at over 186,000 miles per second. In 2 Peter 3 comes one of the great prophecies found in the New Testament about the last days where scoffers are going to come and they're going to be willingly ignorant of the fact that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Now, it also says they'll deny that the world that was being overflowed with water perished. I, I cover that and the reason for that in our Old Earth Global Flood teachings and many other of our messages because it's a huge issue today. But they're also going to deny that by the word of God, the heavens were made of old. They were made mature. God made a mature universe to be seen for signs of the seasons, days, and years, as we're told, when God describes the fourth day of his creation. Now, the Hubble telescope was put up in outer space by NASA. It hovers, oh, about 353 miles above our planet. It has a tremendously powerful telescope. And NASA pointed that powerful telescope into outer space. It's so powerful, it just covers a small pinprick of space at a time. Now, what they wanted to do is capture the first light from right after the Big Bang, proving the Bible is not correct. So they aimed that ter powerful telescope into a little pinprick of space and left the lens open for eight hours to capture that first light from right after the Big Bang and the start of the universe from a secular interpretation. But after eight hours, when they developed the film, what they found were 600 mature spiral wound galaxies. Each of those galaxies made up of billions of individual stars with no light from a supposed Big Bang. They found the universe to be mature. In the book of Genesis, God gives Abraham a promise saying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. So in the book of Genesis, God compares the number of stars in heaven to the grains of sand on the beaches. Well, at this time, you could only see about 1,500 stars with the naked eye. Well, NASA aims at powerful telescope in outer space again, and this time they leave the lens open for 96 hours Sure, they're going to find that light from the start of the universe and the Big Bang. 
After they develop the film, they find 3,000 completely mature spiral wound galaxies in this tiny little pinprick of space, each galaxy made up of billions of individual stars. They now say the stars are innumerable. They are comparable to the grains of sand on the beaches of the earth, just like the Word of God has told us from Genesis, the book of Genesis. And they're all mature galaxies. In 2 Peter, we're told the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. So it's not that I don't believe in the Big Bang, just the Big Bang hasn't happened yet. But it's coming and you better be ready for it. In Psalm, we're told that God tells the numbers of the stars and he calls each by their name. Think about this. God has a name for every individual star. Just as he knows each and every one of us as individuals. He can even count the numbers of hair on our head, which is easier for some of us than others. <laughs> but he knows each and every one of his stars by their name. And if he cares that much about his stars, think about how much he cares about each and every one of you, created in his own image. And by the word of God, the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth. This is an artist's conception of our Milky Way. We can't get far enough away to take a picture of it, but this is an artist's conception. The Earth would be located about two-thirds of the way out in one of these more open areas. And ten times in Scripture, we are told that God stretched out the heavens. He made the heavens mature. At His spoken word, He stretched them out. Today, many people say, well, God couldn't give light here in a six-day creation. Well, technically, that's correct. He got light here on the first day of creation. Remember, he is hovering above the waters. He was here when he got light here. And he's going to provide light in the new heaven and the new earth as well. When you think God can't do something, you, you are not comprehending your humongous creator. This is the Horsehead Nebula. It's estimated you could take... 100 of our solar systems and lay them end to end to cover the snout of the Horsehead Nebula. Here's a picture of the Earth taken from the Voyager 1 spacecraft back in 1990. The spacecraft took this picture from three and three quarter billion miles away and they caught Earth in a golden band of light. This is a close-up of our planet. Uh, atheists and humanists oftentimes think we're just lonely, we're just going to die and go back to dust, and there's no hope for the future. They see no hope in this picture. I tell you, God made us in his image. He made that planet for us to inhabit, and he knows even the stars by their name. He cares about each and every one of us. Jesus Christ is the hope for the future. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that heaven is God's throne and earth is his footstool. So let's look at some more of the great stars that God made on day four, literally in his spare time. We should look at those stars today and realize that the heavens declare the glory of God. They don't limit him to what he can do. He is beyond limitation. He is our astronomical God. And the heavens do declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Well, from the book of Matthew, we can read that, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Well, there's a lot of speculation on, on how God may have caused this to take place. Uh, one of the, the man-made theories is, well, Jupiter orbits the sun once every 12 years. And Venus is the second planet from the sun. It's the third brightest natural object in the night sky after the sun and the moon. Some people think perhaps Jupiter and Venus appeared to line up one on top of the other, forming what appeared to be a single star in the sky. And others think perhaps the star was a meteorite or a supernova. Others think, and I agree more in this camp, that it was a special creation by God. 
You know, the first Christmas was a time of miracles. The Christmas star, I believe, was likely a supernatural event. God provided his Shekinah glory and a pillar of fire to guide the Israelites. On the first Christmas night, God's light shone upon the shepherds. And I think that he made a special creation with that Christmas star, the star of Bethlehem as well. But when they saw the star, whatever it may have been, however God orchestrated it, they rejoiced with exceeding glory. And when we look at the stars in the heavens, when we think about the great love that God has given to us by sending his only begotten son to suffer and die in our place so our sins could be forgiven and we can spend eternity with him in heaven, we should rejoice as well because yes, indeed, the heavens do indeed declare the glory of our biblical creator, judge, and redeeming savior, Lord Jesus the Christ. This is a picture of the majestic sombrero galaxy it's 50,000 light years across. That fuzzy white area is made up of individual stars with billions of light years in between each of those stars. Let me show you one more fingerprint of God upon his creation. I want to show you what's called the X structure at the core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. The Whirlpool Galaxy is one of the billions of grand design Whirlpool galaxies seen in God's heavens. NASA took their Hubble telescope and aimed that powerful telescope at the very center of the Whirlpool galaxy. And this is the picture they came up with. Well, they call that the X structure at the core of the Whirlpool galaxy. I call that one of the fingerprints of God upon his creation. But is not God in the height of the heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they truly are. I wanted to show you what I call astronomical God in the highest, that the universe declares the glory of our biblical creator, that God's fingerprints are seen throughout his creation. And I want you to know that the calling of this ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues in order to expose false anti-biblical teachings in order to provide a hope for all true believers and all true seekers. Our DVDs are not copyrighted. When you get our DVDs, I encourage you to make all the copies you want. Give them to everybody you would like and ask them to make copies and give away as well. Let's get out there and let's make a difference in people's lives. Our resources include our DVD study sets, our individual DVDs, our DVD sets. My book, It's About Time, covers creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues in easy to understand terms for everybody. And we have coloring books for kids on Noah's Ark and dinosaurs, which cover also biblical foundations and America's Christian heritage coloring books. Visit our website at creationministries.org and share it with others. You can watch tons of our free DVDs on our home page. Let's get involved and let's make a difference in the lives of other people for eternity. And remember that the heavens do indeed declare the glory of God. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for every dear person that's here. I ask you to please use the information we've shared this morning uh, to be a, a blessing and to open our eyes as to the absolute, complete, and total astronomical God that you are. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that I do pray. Amen.